Hello again. This is part two of our Archaeology of Montana Anthropology 150 lectures for week three. This is the online section three on obsidian, and in particular, the topic of this lecture is Obsidian Cliff, Yellowstone's only Native American National Historic Landmark. Obsidian Cliff formed during, as part of Yellowstone's very active uh, volcano. Uh, there's a very large island park caldera that formed in 2.1 million years ago. The main part of the Yellowstone caldera formed about 640,000 years ago. Uh, Obsidian Cliff and Cougar Creek formed by another much more recent magma extrusion about 180,000 years ago. So what is Obsidian Cliff? It's a very popular place to collect obsidian by Native Americans in Yellowstone. Uh, the Crow word for Obsidian Cliff is here. Um, there's all kinds of uh, other Native American uh, words for uh, Obsidian Cliff. It was very well known, not just by the Crow, but by the multiple bands of the Shoshone, the Blackfeet, the Nez Perce, uh, the Salish Kootenai, uh, the Kiowa, uh, among many other, many other tribes. Where is Obsidian Cliff? It's located in the northwest corner of Yellowstone National Park between the towns of Gardner and Mammoth Hot Springs and the Norris Geyser Basin. As I showed in the slide before, Obsidian Cliff formed during a volcanic eruption 180,000 years ago. In terms of its area and vol volume, the total area encompassed by Obsidian Cliff is 14.5 square kilometers or 3,580 acres. Its depth varies uh, from very minimal depths to as much as 30 meters thick. The total volume of obsidian at the quarry I have estimated to be 5 trillion cubic yards. That's enough to fill a couple hundred giant football stadiums to the brim with very glassy, high quality obsidian. These are all the prehistoric or pre contact Native American, Native. National Historic Landmarks, or NHLs, in Wyoming and Montana. First Peoples Buffalo Jump up by Great Falls, the Hagen Archaeological Site over on the eastern central part of Montana, Pictograph Cave near Billings, the Horner Site by Cody, and the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, uh, which is in the Bear Bighorn Mountains in north central Montana. The one that we're talking about, obviously, is Obsidian Cliff, and so it is the only Native American National Historic Landmark in the region associated with material procurement. There's actually only three Native American stone quarries listed on the National Historic Landmark. Uh, one is a Hawaiian quarry uh, on Mon the Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii. The second is a Native American quarry in North Dakota called the Lynch Knife River Flint Quarry. And the final one is uh, the National Historic Landmark that we're talking about here, uh, the 1996 listing of Obsidian Cliff, Wyoming. Uh, there's another national monument called the Alabates Flint Quarry in Texas, but it's not a National Historic Landmark, it's a national monument. So in terms of the history of study, Obsidian Cliff has been a focus of archaeologists and historians since the late 1800s. William Henry Holmes was the USGS geologist who visited Yellowstone just, uh, before, or just, just before 1880, so in the late 1870s. He was the first to uh, document the obsidian quarries at Obsidian Cliff. Uh, soon after that, Joseph Iddings, also of the USGS, did a full mapping of Obsidian Cliff. James Griffin was the first to use um, sourcing technologies in order to show that Midwestern Native American tribes used obsidian from Yellowstone. And finally, Leslie Davis, uh, who was at Montana State University and the Museum of the Rockies from 1966 to 2014, um, uh, was central in the further study of Native American use of obsidian cliff uh, in the greater Yellowstone region. The most important study in recent times of Obsidian Cliff was conducted by the Museum of the Rockies and National Park Service by Les Davis, Ann Johnson, Steve Auberg, and Adrian Anderson. That was after the big 1988 fire. Their group of archaeologists went into Obsidian Cliff 
to document the quarries because most of the ground had been cleared of surface vegetation. They documented hundreds of pits and trenches and millions and millions of flakes and cores and stone tools made from the very high quality obsidian cliff obsidian. That was all published in a 1989 uh, Montana State University survey publication by Leslie Davis, Stephen Auberg, James Schmidt, and Ann Johnson. It was called the Obsidian Cliff Plateau Prehistoric Lithic Source, Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming. They documented all the trenches and quarries. This photograph on the right is a great photo of a trench with the human there as scale. Here are some more photographs from the National Historic Landmark listing. This is a great photo of a very deep pit and another trench. thing I love about this photo is that the person's carrying an umbrella. I can't imagine walking through dense woods with an umbrella, but they got away with it. <laughs> we went up there in 2010 uh, with my archaeological field school. It is illegal to go up on the cliff now, just to let you know. Do not try to do that. You will get a ticket. Um, it's very dangerous given all the new growth since the 88 fire and a lot of the trees have since fallen. So it's a, just a, a mess with down trees and young pines very thickly growing in, on Obsidian Cliff. When you go up there though, this is one of our, our students, C.J. Truesdale, holding up a large obsidian boulder. The end result of all those studies was the 1996 National Historic Listing of Obsidian Cliff. So there's two types of very specific analyses that can be done uh, on obsidian, not just obsidian cliff obsidian, but all obsidian and all volcanic materials, including dacite and basalt, uh, can be sourced. Um, this is through X-ray fluorescence. So the machine in the center of this slide is an X-ray fluorescence handheld gun. Um, you can source the material by analyzing its chemical composition by linking artifacts at archaeological sites to the source materials. There's also been a method of dating of obsidian based on the a rind that forms on the obsidian over time. Les Davis uh, was pop popularized that method of dating. The University of Montana conducted a survey of power lines that stretch along the Solfatera Creek south of Obsidian Cliff. And these are a couple of photographs of the University of Montana survey just showing the dense distribution of obsidian um, at the site. We found a couple stone circles and some possibly te possible teepee poles as well. So in terms of the significance of Obsidian Cliff, uh, there is a, a huge amount of use, both locally, regionally, and nationally. Uh, the local significance in terms of the organization of technology is that uh, it was procured at Obsidian Cliff. Uh, most Native American tribes in the region visited the cliff to collect it, produce, use, and discard tools from all time periods. Um, what you can see here, this is uh, a summary of the local significance in terms of uh, archaeological sites within Yellowstone National Park, investigated by our teams from the University of Montana from 2006 to 2015. Um, this is from all over the park, and, and as, as you can see, nearly 70% of the artifacts that we find any, everywhere in Yellowstone come from Obsidian Cliff. Uh, there is a variation in use in terms of geography. So the, uh, the, with the distance you travel away from the Obsidian Cliff source, there's less and less of the material used so that once, once you get down into areas like the Lewis River and the Snake River in the southern area of Yellowstone, Obsidian Cliff isn't quite as important. In comparison, at that, in those locations, the Teton obsidians become very important. In terms of uh, we know that obsidian cliff was used to produce obsidian for a couple Clovis points. Uh, the Clovis point we found at Yellowstone Lake was produced from obsidian cliff obsidian. The Fen Cache is a famous Clovis cache site with obsidian cliff obsidian projectile point as well. Uh, the early archaic period at Fishing Bridge Point site at Yellowstone Lake had uh, over 90% obsidian cliff obsidian. In terms of the middle archaic period, we saw that the uh, the cache site near Livingston, Montana, was all a bunch of bifaces produced from obsidian cliff obsidian. That's called the yearling spring cache. 
In the late archaic period, of course, this is the most common period in which Native Americans used obsidian cliff obsidian, uh, and the obsidian then became incorporated into the Hopewell Interact sphere. In terms of recent prehistory, an obsidian cliff uh, continues to be used by late prehistoric and historic Native Americans. So which tribes used obsidian cliff and use it to, to this day in some cases? The Nez Perce, the Shoshone, the Salish, the Blackfeet, uh, the different bands of the Shoshone, the Crow, uh, the Kiowa, all the tribes that are known to uh, live and use Yellowstone visited Obsidian Cliff. In terms of the regional significance and distribution across North America, Obsidian Cliff Obsidian is one of the few lithic raw materials from, the, from Yellowstone that's found in the greater Midwest region, all the Canadian provinces, and as far east as Ohio. So in terms of obsidian use in northwest Wyoming and southwest Montana, obsidian cliff comprises about 60% of the obsidian. Bear Gulch is a famous source on the Montana-Idaho line. It comprises about 30%, and the Teton Pass sources down by Jackson, Wyoming, have about 8%. So obsidian cliff is, has national significance as because it was incorporated into the Hopewell Interaction Sphere. The Mound Builders were an early and middle woodland period group of Native Americans that corresponds to our later archaic period in Yellowstone. They lived in the Midwestern River Valleys in Wisconsin, Mississippi, Ohio, and the Midwestern states. They lived in large villages and cities of hundreds and thousands of Native Americans. They grew corn, beans, and squash to supplement hunted and gathered foods. Uh, they built mounds for ceremonies and for burials. There is an uh, illustration uh, in a famous article by Warren DeBoer called Little Bighorn on the Shioto that was published in American Antiquity in 2004. This illustration on the left was reproduced for my Before Yellowstone book on the right by artist Eric Carlson, uh, showing uh, that this uh, shaman is interpreted to have a bighorn sheep horn made of copper, very large bifaces made of obsidian cliff obsidian. Uh, there's also pottery motifs in the Shioto, Ohio culture that uh, are of a bighorn style as well. These are a couple of the obsidian bifaces from what's called Hopewell Mound 17 in Ohio. These are uh, were documented by Richard Hughes in an article that he published in 2007. Obsidian Cliff at Mound 11 on the Shioto Mound 25 contained a large deposit of obsidian, which is believed to be and now is sourced from the Yellowstone National Park, weighing close to 300 pounds. The findings are so great an amount of raw obsidian seems to justify the surmise that the fine obsidian implements from Mound 25 by the former survey were fashioned on the site of the Hopewell Group. In fact, at some of these mounds, there is evidence of extensive amounts of lithic devotage where the obsidian bifaces were produced. So what is the evidence of the Hopewell actually traveling from Ohio and the Midwestern states to Yellowstone? We haven't actually found any Ohio artifacts in Yellowstone. However, we have found a couple Hopewell or Midwestern style knives found around Yellowstone Lake and other areas of Yellowstone. There were bighorn sheep motifs on Hopewell, Ohio pottery. There were bighorn sheep copper sculptures, not just in Ohio, but in other Midwestern burial situations as well. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of pounds of Yellowstone obsidian in Ohio mounds. And the inference by DeBoer, and, and something that I support also, is that Hopewell Native Americans probably traveled to Yellowstone. So how did the Hopewell get their obsidian? Well, we know they used boats. And if they used boats, they could have traveled by canoe much of the way and walking the rest of the way traveling the same distance approximately the same route that Lewis and Clark did in the early 1800s that would have entailed approximately a 3,600 mile round trip. If that averaged 20 miles per day, they could have done it entirely during the warm season between April 1st and September 30th. Certainly Hopewell Interaction Sphere was the major, major impetus for the distribution of obsidian across the North America. Uh, most of it was traded, but I think there is a, a certain um, amount that might have been directly procured by Native Americans from the Midwestern regions, including possibly Native Americans from Ohio. It's definitely a hypothesis that's worth pursuing in the future. 
So, Obsidian Cliff, the National Historic Landmark, was established in 1996. It celebrated its 20 years of National Historic Landmark listing and 12,000 years of use about five years ago. In fact, in this 2021, we just celebrated its 25th anniversary. Obsidian Cliff, Wyoming, in Yellowstone National Park, is one of the most important archaeological sites in the region.